chapter 18, it describes the, the scene of Sennacherib and Rabshakeh. When I was in school, he always told us, my teacher said that it's Sennacherib, snack ribs, and Rabshakeh's rib shack. I don't know if that's, that helps you remember them, but uh, Sennacherib was the king of Assyria, and he was the one that brought the nation of Assyria down on the northern kingdom and destroyed them. And it says in chapter 18 that he goes up to all the cities of Judah, the southern kingdom, and he destroys them and he besieges the city of Jerusalem itself. And Sennacherib begins to challenge Hezekiah, who was king, as he was holed up in the city itself telling them that there's no way that you can defeat us. We're going to destroy the city, whether you like it or not. And, of course, they didn't immediately give up. And so Sennacherib sent Rabshakeh. Now, Rabshakeh was basically a, a prophet or a spokesperson for the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. And Rabshakeh would go out every day and he would begin to taunt and challenge the people of Israel. And he would tell them that, there's no reason for you to, to trust in, in Hezekiah. Don't listen to him when he says that, the, that your God is going to deliver you because your God is not going to deliver you. And uh, the spokesman from Hezekiah would go out and meet with Rabshakeh. And they actually they asked him, they said, speak in the Aramaic tongue because we understand that. But if you speak in the language of Judah, then all the people that are along the walls are going to hear you and their hearts will fail. And of course, Rabshakeh refused to speak in the language they were making and continued to taunt them in their own native language. But he asked this question. He says, in what do you place your trust right now? In whom do you trust? Now, Rabshakeh said there was no reason for them to trust anything. But Hezekiah knew there was a reason to trust in God. It wasn't but a few generations later Jerusalem is besieged again. We find ourselves in the book of Lamentation in chapter 4 as the poet is seeing this destruction. We understand in the history of, of the city itself, or of the nation of Judah, that it was carried away by the Babylonians. This time it wasn't the Assyrians that had besieged them, but it's, it's the Babylonians. And it was in about 606 B.C., just a few years after they defeat, uh, defeated Nineveh in 612, uh, remember, we're going B.C., so six years later in 606, uh, they, they have turned their focus from sacking the Assyrian Empire now to uh, capturing and defeating what remained of the Jewish Empire as well. Jerusalem, basically the main city, and they have, they have encompassed it around. And uh, that first deportation included men like uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, uh, Ezekiel, all of those were carried off in that first deportation. Jeremiah, the great prophet, though, is in the city before then. He's in the city during that time of deportation, and he's in the city afterwards. And if Jeremiah is the one who's writing Lamentations, which I believe he probably is, he's, he's seeing this deportation. And he sees that the walls of Jerusalem are surrounded about by the Babylonian army sees that the food is being cut off and he's seeing these, these shocking and, and heart-disturbing images and scenes of the nation, of the city in, in peril and turmoil. And he's seeing the next deportation, which comes about 10 years later in 596 or so. And they, they take off some more. And this time Jeremiah is still left behind. But he sees many of his friends and those who were part of the kingdom also carried away. And ultimately, he will see the destruction of Jerusalem in its entirety, including the house of God, the house of the leaders, the, the, the castles or the palaces, and the house of all, all the great people in the city of Jerusalem. And he witnesses these things. And as he's looking around and he's seeing this destruction and, and writing this, this poem of lamentation, he is reminded of God's promises. He's reminded, I think, of, of the words of Sennacherib or Rabshakeh when he asks, In who do you trust? Chapter 4, as we, we come to this particular chapter, it focuses on their misplaced trust. And I think we can, we can see a lot of American society, even world society in this, in how we place our trust in things that don't last. We place our trust in things like riches that often are squandered and spent away. We place our trust in, in things that we think are permanent like a house that can 
be burned to the ground or in friends that might betray us, even in the spouse that may betray us. We place trust in these, these things that, that sometimes there's no reason for those trusts to be placed there. And that's what was happening in the nation of Israel. And so we turn to chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we see uh, uh, really in these first 10 or 11 verses a, a dehumanized people. They don't even seem human anymore based upon what, what's happening. In the mind of Israel, they were the cream of the crop. They were the apple of God's eye, the chosen people, and therefore they were more valuable than all the other nations that surrounded them. And so the poet comes and he, he plays upon their, their image of themselves. He says, how the gold has grown dim. How the pure gold has changed. The, the holy stones, these, these children of God that were raised in holiest now lie scattered at the head of every street. They are as common as the dirt and rubble in the street. The, the gold is tarnished. It is rusted. There is, uh, it has become as valueless as the base metals, you know, tin and, and iron. Those things were considered the base metals. They might be strong, but they weren't valuable. That's how they looked at all the other nations. That you're, you're like cast iron. We're gold. And the poet says, wait a minute, we were once gold, but we are tarnished. We have become as valueless as the base metals themselves. The precious sons of Zion worth their weight in gold. How they are regarded as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hand. I don't think the poet is necessarily making reference to God as the potter and, and they are the clay. He's, he's making reference to the fact that a, a clay vessel is not as valuable as a gold vessel. That dirt is not as valuable as gold. He said, you who were once worth your weight in gold are now worth your weight in dirt. You have no value. Verse 3, he sees how the parents have even uh, uh, stopped taking care of their children the way they should. Even the jackal offers the breast to nurse their young. But the daughter of my people has become cruel. The ostrich are like the ostriches in the wilderness. And the ostrich was well known, um, a, a parable or proverb, we might say, of, of poor parenting. That it seemed that they disregarded their young in the wild. And he says, you, you know, wild animals are better parents than you are. The tongue of the nursing infant sticks to the roof of his mouth for thirst. The child begs for food, but no one gives to them. There are certain things in this world that when we see, we cannot unsee them. There are images that are burned into our minds that are so shocking, that are so horrific, that that we can't help but remember them and they, they crop up in our everyday speech. And I, I see that in in the poet here because he keeps coming back to this image of starving children. Can you imagine what it would have been like to see the children begging for food and not receiving any? Uh, to, to watch them not just hurt with hunger pains, but ultimately to die because of it. How terrifying that would have been. How shocking that would have been. How unhuman-like that would have been that they were not even taking care of their own children. And yet he mentions, mentions it in chapter 1. He mentions it in chapter 2. He mentions it again here in chapter 4. It was something that was so horrific he could not unsee it. But it gets even worse. Because not only does he see that, but we see in verse 10, the hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They have become their food during the destruction of the daughter of my people. And again, we are shocked. We are horrified by, you know, how could a parent do this? And yet the interesting thing is in this case, and again, he's, he mentions it in chapter 2 a couple of times, and he mentions it here in chapter 4, this, this cannibalism, and, and we're so shocked by it. But he says here that these were the hands of who? The compassionate women. Why? Because their children were cut off quickly as opposed to letting them their pain and their anguish prolong to the point of starvation. They were the compassionate ones. We see uh, further uh, uh, evidence of their, their uh, demise and this dehumanization of the people. Uh, in chapter in, in, in verse 6, he says that, For the chastisement of the daughter of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom. This morning John was talking about Sodom in, in, in Genesis chapter 18 and, and we're seeing this city that, that 
ultimately is going to be destroyed in chapter 19 because of their sin. They became the standard of punishment based upon their wickedness. Throughout the generations from the time of Genesis 19 on, uh, uh, the parents would warn their children, uh, don't you do that, I'll go all Sodom on you. Don't do that, you will be destroyed just like Sodom. God used it to warn the children of Israel, I will destroy you just like I destroyed Sodom. In the New Testament, Jesus says uh, to some, some city, he says, woe to you because it will be better on the day of Sodom than it will be for you. They became the standard by which punishment was measured. And now he says that, that what is happening to the nation of Israel, to Jerusalem in particular, is greater or worse punishment than what Sodom received. Why? <clears throat> Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, and no hands were wrung for her. That last phrase, the, the translation is a little bit uh, uh, uncertain. But the idea is that it happened so quickly that the people didn't even have time to worry about Sodom. The people of Sodom were not warned days, weeks, months, years in advance and said, you know, you better watch out or you're going to be destroyed. It just came upon them and it was done. And there was no time for people to worry and anguish about it. It was just done. He says, for you, though, the warnings were there time and time and time again. And yet because of your unrighteousness, those warnings were drawn out and drawn out and drawn out and drawn out. And now the punishment comes. And it's not something where the nation was cut off quickly. But it's something where the siege came, the starvation came, the water is cut off, and the people are dying. Verses 7 through 10 is kind of a repeat of, of the, the verses 1 through 6, identifying first the, how their, their, uh, their wealth and their, their, their appearance, their apparel. Uh, he says that they were purer than snow, whiter than milk, their bodies more ruddy than coral. The beauty of their form was like sapphire. Uh, they, were, they were dressed impeccably. They had wealth, and, and that belied what they thought was, was their uh, true righteousness, but it wasn't. What it, what it really uh, uh, covered was their unrighteousness. And that's how people today, you know, look I, look at me, I'm so blessed, how can I possibly be wrong? I drive a better car, wear finer clothes, I have a bigger house. And we measure our righteousness or spiritual success based upon our physical wealth. And that's what they were doing. And what it didn't reveal was their true unrighteousness. But now he says of them in verse 8, their face is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in their streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry wood. They, are, they have no food. They, they normally would eat the delicacies, but those things have been taken away. And now they are starving just like everybody else in the streets. Happier were the victims of the sword than the victims of hunger who wasted away, pierced by the lack of the fruits of the field. We, we, we look at these people and, and we hardly recognize them as human for us. We, we don't uh, uh, associate well with those who are, are dying in starvation. We, we don't know that kind of starvation. You know, we know 5 o'clock we get a little ache in our belly and we just go to the cupboard and we fix it. We don't know hunger of... Five days, five weeks, five months to the point of death. We, we, we don't understand uh, uh, the idea of cannibalism. I mean, we understand, we, we grasp it, but can you imagine if that's how we survived? We, we, we can't put that together. This is so far from human decency to leave children unattended and uncared for. And we... we you know the the commercials come on TV about third world nations and children with you know um, that are malnourished and and we get our pocketbooks out because we can't stand to see that and yet there was no relief coming to the nation of Israel. This doesn't even register register to us as as humanity and yet in in deuteronomy uh, twenty five Beginning in verse 53, he says there's going to come a time that this nation will be besieged. There's going to come a time when you are starving. There's going to come a time when you resort 
to cannibalism. There's going to come a time when your leaders will not lead you or they will lead you astray. God warned them, even in the days of Moses, that if you don't listen to these words, this is what's going to happen. And yet they waltzed right into it without a care. And so we begin in verse 12, or looking in verse 12 then, we see what they have been trusting in that was worthless. He begins in verse 12, he says, The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. Sennacherib really thought that he was going to be able to waltz right into Jerusalem, destroy the city, knock down the walls, burn the houses and the, and the temple, and, and, and capture all the people and lead them tribute. What happened, though, was he thought God was on his side. But God wasn't. God saved them. When Hezekiah uh, was challenged by Sennacherib, he sent to Isaiah and he asked Isaiah, what is the word of the Lord? What does God tell us to do? And Isaiah sent back word and he said, Hezekiah, don't worry about it. God is going to take care of this city. He will protect it from Sennacherib. You know, the Assyrian journals, even the, their stone tablets and the stories that they tell, they say that uh, uh, they, they, they came to Jerusalem or to the Jews and they shut them up like a bird in the cage. But in the end, they were called away and did not capture the city. Even, even the Assyrians in their own writings admit that they had Jerusalem in the palm of their hand, but they couldn't take it. And that furthered the notion that nobody would ever be able to take Jerusalem. God was on their side. The gate would never open for the enemies of the Jews. They believed. The inhabitants of the city believed. We are in Jerusalem. Nothing can destroy Jerusalem. That was their first mistake. In trusting in a city instead of trusting in God. Look at verse 13. This was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquity of her priests who shed in the, in the midst of her the blood of the righteous. The prophets and the priests, he's mentioned how they failed to lead them and teach them in the ways of righteousness, but they continue to trust them. They trust their leadership. How, well, how are our priests going to lead us astray? How, how are our prophets going to lead us astray? They, they're not going to steer us wrong. Oh, they're going to kill God's righteous prophets? Well, that must be what God wants them to do. They're going to follow these false and foreign gods? Well, that must be God's will. Because we trust them. Our leaders will never lead us astray. They wandered blind through the streets. They were so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. The prophets and the priests had blood on their hands. But, but not just that. They, they, they had so separated themselves from God that, that the people were treating them like lepers. Notice verse 15. Away, unclean, the people cried at them. Away, away, do not touch. Those were the words that were commanded to the lepers in Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46. That's how they were to warn everyone else. Don't come near us because our leprosy is contagious and it could kill you. They looked upon the priest. They finally realized they're leading us astray. But the Lord himself scattered them. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Verse 15. Away, away. Notice. They became fugitives, these priests and prophets, these false priests and prophets, wanderers. And people said among the nations, when they left Jerusalem, they went to other places looking for some sort of a sanctuary with them. Those nations said, they shall no longer stay with us. We don't want them. They're ostracized from everybody. And God scatters them and shows no honor. That was their second mistake trusting in their leaders without following God. And it brought their destruction. Number three, verse 17, our eyes failed, watching vainly for help. In our watching, we watched for a nation which could not save. Well, let's look back at the history again. Uh, it was uh, in, 2 Kings, in 2 Kings 23, Jehoiakim, I couldn't read my 23 there. <laughs> it looked like a 25. Uh, Jehoiakim, who was a, a puppet king, who was established or set up by Pharaoh Necho during this time. And Jehoiakim paid tribute to Egypt. 
And so when the Babylonians surrounded Jerusalem, the first thing they wanted to do was what? Send to Egypt for help. And so they sent a failed mission. Jeremiah even says in Jeremiah 37 and verse 7 that he knew all along it was going to fail. And they sent to Pharaoh Necho to, to, to bring him out, or to the Pharaoh of Egypt, to bring out his troops and help fight off the Babylonians. And they would be a, a tribute or servants of, of the Egyptian nation. And so they sent them out and they watched. And they watched. And it says, we failed. Our eyes failed ever watching vainly for help. Why? Because the help wasn't going to come. That nation, Egypt, could not save them. So what happened? Well, after Jehoiakim had done that, they, he was taken away and removed by the Babylonians. And in his place was set up uh, uh, Gedaliah, who was not a king, but he was established as a governor uh, to watch over those who were still left in Jerusalem. Set up this time by the Babylonians, not by the, by the Egyptians. And it says, they dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Who? The, the Babylonians. They kept a tight rein on them. So what? So, so Gedaliah couldn't try another failed mission to Egypt. They were trusting in their false alliances instead of God. And for their, therefore they were destroyed. He said, our end drew near. Our days were numbered for our end had come. The poet sees the end. He knows this is it. Egypt can't help us. Nobody can help us. We are being destroyed and punished by God. And then in verse 20, the fourth false hope that they trusted in, the breath of our nostrils, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits. The Lord's anointed, normally we think of that as the Messiah or the Christ. We almost think that possibly a help and hope is coming in the Lord's anointed here. What he's making reference to is to the king. Yet Eliah was eventually taken out, and there was another man who was placed as the king. His name was Zedekiah. Zedekiah is the Lord's anointed. He is the one who is sitting upon the throne of David. But he says, The breath of our nostril, the Lord's anointed, was captured in their pits or in their traps. They were, he was snatched up, of whom we said, under his shadow we shall live among the nations. Under whose shadow? Under the shadow of the king. But what, he make, what he's making reference to is to the promise that God made to David, that your descendants shall sit upon your throne forever. And they thought, well, God had made this promise to the kings that the kings would never leave the throne, that, that, that the Davidic covenant and the Davidic dynasty would be there forever and ever and ever. God, of course, was looking for who? Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, where the angel tells Mary at the great annunciation that uh, your son will sit upon the throne of his father David. He will fulfill the promise that God made to David that there would be one who would sit upon his throne forever. And so God can be faithful to his promise and yet still let Zedekiah be destroyed. And Zedekiah, of course, fled the nation, left the city. He was going to save himself. He got as far as Jericho when Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian army caught up with him. They captured him. They, they took his sons and killed them in front of him, put out his eyes so that was the last vision they ever saw and carried him away into captivity subjected him in humility. This was the one that they had their trust in. The shadow of the King David in Zedekiah. But Zedekiah was nothing like King David. It says that he did that which was evil in the sight of God. So what do we do? All, all these false places of hope, we, we're reminded of the question of, of Rabshakeh, in whom do you place your trust? Well, what do you do? Uh, you, you can't trust in the city to save you. You can't trust in your leaders, uh, your religious leaders to save you. You can't trust in alliances to save you. You can't even trust in your king to save you. Where do you turn? And the answer is God. And here's the hope that we see in chapter 4. In verse 21 and 22. Rejoice and be glad. Oh, there's the positive. But wait. <laughs> He's not telling Jerusalem to rejoice and be glad. Who's he telling? Edom. This was the, the uh, uh, 
the enemy of the nation of Israel from the beginning of its inception. Edom comes from where? Esau. Jacob and Esau. Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel, who becomes the father of the nation of Israel. And Esau, whose grandson is Edom and becomes the nation of Edom. They had been in conflict with one another since the beginning. Since their, their birth, they had been in conflict, right? And now they're still in conflict. Uh, the book of Obadiah is written to the Edomites. Amos mentions the cruelty of the Edomites. Many of the prophets address the Edomites and, and their sin and how they would stand back and they say, oh, we're not hurting Israel. No, but they became the gateway through which the Egyptians or the Babylonians or the Assyrians uh, you know, persecuted the nation of Israel. They offered no help. They offered no assistance. And oftentimes they mocked them and were cruel to those who were being oppressed. And so he says now, he says, rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, you who dwell in the land of Uz. That is, rejoice for now, because it's not going to last forever. But to you also the cup shall pass, and you shall become drunk and strip yourselves bare. That cup is the cup of punishment. In other words, rejoice for now for a time, but it's going to end. Why? The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. It's interesting. The poet says in verse 18, Our end had come. And now he hears from God, No, your punishment is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. But your iniquity, O daughter of, jo of Edom, he will punish. He will uncover your sins. As the nation looked out and saw all of those that were against her, particularly Edom, which had been a perennial enemy in conflict with them, he says, when you see them get their just deserts, you will know that your punishment is ended and the hope of Israel has returned. Why? Because God, God was going to keep His promise to the very end. And that's the way it is with us. When we are in our sin, lost, separated from God, we are less than human. I know we like to think of ourselves as human, but we're less than human when we are separated because God created us to be with Him. God created us to need Him. And when we reject Him, we are less than how God created us. And in those moments of our despair, in those moments where... Uh, Life is not working and we understand and recognize that we need something more than what I can give myself in this day and age. There's only one place to go. It's to God. Don't trust in the world's riches. Don't trust in wisdom. Don't trust in education. Don't trust in money. Don't trust in all these things the world trusts in. Turn to God because He is the only one who will never leave you and never forsake you. If tonight you need to place your trust in the Heavenly Father who longs for you, to be with Him. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?